Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. Uh, probably most of you watching this have watched other ones, but if any of you haven't, um, if you go to bathgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, you'll see about 355 of them at this point archived uh, under the past interviews menu, archived in about four or five different ways. Um, this program is made freely available to anyone who wants to watch it, and it is all made possible by those who feel like supporting it to some degree financially. So there's a donate button on the right-hand side of the page. Um, if you feel inspired to help support it, click that. Um, my guest today is Adam Chaxfield. I'll just read his official little bio here, and uh, especially for the benefit of those who might be listening to the audio podcast and uh, won't have read the bio on the website. Adam is a um, non-dual spiritual teacher whose retreats and private sessions are known for their transformative power and love-saturated depth. He devotedly serves the alive field of awareness as it unfolds, reveals, and liberates, rather than any fixed philosophy. Adam first turned towards spirituality and meditation after a series of profound psychedelic-assisted openings led him to experience the truth that lies beyond all philosophies. <clears throat> At age 33, he left his career as a university professor of political theory to devote his life to spiritual unfolding. For a few years, Adam struggled to try to piece together all the apparently contradictory teachings and practices. These efforts decisively fell away when he came across the non-dual teaching of Peter Fenner and realized the openness that can never be captured in words and requires no practice. Adam started inviting his friends to do non-dual inquiry with him and was amazed by the ease with which the direct experience of openness could be shared. In 2010, with Peter Fenner's encouragement and support, Adam started to publicly share with groups and individuals. Since then, his teaching has been profoundly influenced by the opportunity to soak in Jeannie Zandi's heart-centered and full-bodied transmission. Adam now shares the direct experience of the heart and mind falling open. In this effortless opening, the suffering involved in resisting feelings and believing thoughts spontaneously releases. The natural abundance of joy, peace, wisdom, and love becomes apparent and available. Heart-centered, gentle, and direct, Adam offers a, a path straight into the truth of who we are. In addition to leading retreats in North America and Europe, Adam meets with individuals and is the creator of Falling Open, a four-month online course. He is also the founder of the Center for Non-Dual Awareness, a supportive community for those called to share non-duality. So, welcome, Adam. Thanks for doing this. Good to meet you. Mm, lovely to be here, Rick. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> so, um, you were over in, you are from Britain originally, and but then you've been in the States for quite a while. You were, you were teaching political philosophy in Macomb, Illinois, of all places? Yeah, 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 West Illinois University. I guess you wanted to be near the birthplace of Ronald Reagan, right? That's why you established yourself. <laughs> 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 I always thought he was Californian, but... <laughs> well, he was born up a couple hours north of where you were teaching. Yeah. And um, yeah, actually, you, you were not too far from where I lived. Did you ever come through Fairfield? Say you went to Des Moines, you must have driven right through Fairfield on your way to Des Moines. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, visited the coffee shop in Fairfield a few times. And, okay, yeah. Cafe Paradiso. <clears throat> or Revelations, mm. it might have been Revelations. Revelations, that's yeah. right, yeah. There's two of them competing. Um, okay, and now you live in the Bay Area, right? Yeah, yeah, just north of Berkeley. Okay, good. Um, so I don't know as much about you as I often know about people I interview because you haven't written a book and you don't have too many videos. Um, but so we'll just kind of wing this, and I'm sure we'll get into all kinds of interesting stuff. But you come highly recommended. Um, uh, Pam Pamela Wilson likes you, so you can't be all bad. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of respect for her. <clears throat> so. Let's let's do the old chronological bit for a few minutes, and before we get into the sort of the substance of what you teach. So, um, you were teaching political philosophy. That mm -hmm. how did you end up in that? Yeah, I was uh, just sort of became fascinated by politics and philosophy and ideas uh, as a teenager, and uh, you know, would debate with people, loved to argue, loved to sort of figure figure stuff out, and uh, 
yeah, so I ended up going to grad school in uh, political science and uh, you know, studying political theory, public policy. And, uh, you know, I was really passionate about figuring out what the truth was, you know, like I really wanted to like, uh, yeah, work it all out. And um, Are you yeah, still so interested in politics? Not so much, no, it's, it's really dropped away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, was, I paid a little attention this year, but, but it's, <laughs> it's not like it used to be at all. You still like to debate people, but not, you know, maybe on spiritual topics or instead of uh, politics, or has that tendency fallen off too? Yeah, that's really got really pulled away. Yeah, I can I can be in the midst of a political argument, like people are arguing around me, and I'm really just like, yeah, just not not interested in getting involved. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I'd, I'd say that that probably has something to do with this openness word, which we'll be talking about more. It's it's hard to sort of be vehement about a fixed position if you're in in openness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's sort of the way that any fixed position is like. Uh, missing part of the whole. It's like it's sort of advancing a, a, a particular posture and uh, highlighting something, but it misses the rest. So yeah. it's, uh, it's hard to invest in those now. Yep. I'm sure everybody's heard the blind man and the elephant metaphor, you know. Mm. Blind men arguing over what an elephant is like, and one's feeling the trunk, and one's feeling the leg, and one's feeling the side. They all have completely different impressions of it, but obviously none of them has the whole elephant. Yeah, and it got to the it got to the point in my sort of academic career where it was like, wow, you know, like I'm uh, I'm like really sincere and smart, and there's all these like super sincere and smart people, and we're all arguing. We all think we're right. We've all got our lovely sophisticated theories and our arguments against everybody else's sophisticated theories. And it's like, you know, what's going on here? We can't, you know, why do I believe that I'm right and these other people are wrong? Or yeah, uh, it's like, and everyone's missing something. Every philosophy is inadequate. You know what I find interesting is that you can have a political preference or a preference for any, any number of things and yet at the same time not be fanatical about it and realize that you know, it's natural for different people to have different preferences and so you kind of grant others the liberty to have their own preferences even though they differ from yours. Except for Trump. <laughs> yeah, <and this> Irene <laughs> just said except for Trump. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and there's a, a way in like, sort of now it's like uh, it, we can sort of feel like where people are coming from, like the sort of the the way that their um, like the heart is obscured, you know, like the way that uh, uh, you know that people cling to a position to protect themselves or to like uh, sort of be, uh, try to convince themselves that they know what the right answer is or what the truth is, and we can sort of we can sort of feel like how that's uh, unfolding through people. Yeah, you know, um, I, I've often thought of this in terms of the the little petty wars that people get into on the internet, where they start bickering over, you know, this or that position. And I don't know. It's it's kind of like, in a way, people are trying to sort of fortify their egos, you know, or buttress mm -hmm. buttress their sort of. There's, there's an insecurity that they're reacting against and trying to protect against by being so vehement about a particular position, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like really vulnerable to just sort of admit we don't know. Yeah. Like to just be, to be sort of like innocently present to what's here and not, not be uh, claiming that we, we know what's going on. Mm. You know, that we have the, uh, that, we, that we sort of can hold the answer in, in the mind, like, uh, you know, we can be the one that knows. It's like to really admit that that's not the case, that we can never grasp the truth with the mind. Yeah. There's a I real was, uh, vulnerability in that, like I don't know. Yeah. There is. I was exchanging emails yesterday with a fellow named Lauren Huff that I've taken a retreat with, um, who's a very interesting spiritual teacher. He doesn't, well, hasn't wanted to be interviewed so far because he's got enough attention as it is. I, I, I just gave him more. But um, he, was saying, he, he was saying, you know, I, I kind of realized at a certain point that I was wrong about everything. And I said, what do you mean you were wrong about everything? He said, well, it's just that I had all this knowledge, but when I actually had the, exper the full experience of to that to which that knowledge pertained, I realized that my concepts, and I'm saying this a little differently than he said it, that my concepts just bore no resemblance to the realities that they were meant to represent. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's so surprising when we open to what's here. 
It's, I mean, I'm constantly surprised. It's, it's like when I when I sit and just sort of allow myself to fall open. It's like, wow, what's going on? You know, like what what's actually here? And it's yeah, it's like bears no resemblance to anything we say about it. Any of the mental models we we hold. It's like we can sort of like we're, it's almost like we're doing poetry. It's sort of the, the most uh, we're sort of invoking or pointing to, but. But like what's actually here is like it's just so subtle, so rich, so different from any uh, any way of symbolizing what's here. Yeah, that's beautiful. Incidentally, I just want to interject for those who are watching the live stream. Um, there is a question form at the bottom of the page, the upcoming interviews page, which is under the upcoming interviews menu on on Batcap, or maybe it's under maybe it's called future interviews so if you want to post a question to adam uh, while we're doing this interview you can find the form there just scroll down to the bottom of the page um all right well this is going well so far we're just kind <laughs> of meandering here but um falling open i want to get into that more um mm. so you you mentioned that you had a um very profound psychedelic experience, or several of them. Um, the truth that lies beyond all philosophy. So, those worth mentioning in any detail? I mean, a lot of people have had those sorts of things, but what was it like for you? Yeah, I mean, the, the first uh, psychedelic uh, experience I had um, was very much sort of uh, the revelation that you were talking about, uh, Warren Huff pointing to. Which is this? Uh, it's Lauren, like wow! I've spent L O R N E is his name. Oh, so Lauren, yeah. Huh? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Just this uh, wow! You know, I spent all this time investing in like my philosophies, my my precious beliefs and ideas, and like you know, I'm so sophisticated and like, I was thinking, wow! I can't affirm a single one. I can't find any starting point for knowing anything. Uh -huh. It's like it's just uh, there's just so many like what is this? And there's like no starting point, no reference point. It's like we have to make up a reference point. Mm. So it's just like really, uh, yeah, and and like there's so much here besides the thoughts, the beliefs that I'm like, you know, I was constantly attending to, just living inside a story, living inside my beliefs, and it's like the sort of the 99.9% .9 of reality that's not a symbol was being completely missed. It's yeah. like wow, it's like there's so much here. It's so alive. When you came off the psychedelics, did you find that you're your reference point and your certainties were kind of reassembling or were you never able to quite, was it like Humpty Dumpty and you could never quite put them back together again? Yeah, it was, um, it was like fascinating. Like, uh, it was, I, was, I was like, like, wow, something really big and profound and important happened there. It was like the sort of the visceral experience of sort of deconstructionism, like, uh, like just yeah, the end of philosophy, like the uh, the meeting of reality that's um, that's not symbolized. Um, but uh, I found that like my, yeah, my mind would want to sort of come up with a story, like an explanation of what that is, and then uh, you know the next time I take a psychedelic, it just be like wow, this is not at all what I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's quite similar to. Uh, like the experience meditating as well. When I first started meditating, I would be trying to figure out what meditation was and I would like have some explanation of what meditation was. And then, you know, when when I'd open to what was true, it's like, wow, it's nothing like I think it is. I mean, this is it's totally different. So it's just like to do that again and again and again in meditation, just uh, just undercutting any any sort of storyline for what reality is or what I am or what meditation is. Yeah. Do you find now, you know, having been on the spiritual path for quite a while, that um, you've been able to s sort of settle into a clearer understanding of what reality is uh, that coincides with your experience, or, or instead have you just kind of gotten comfortable with, with the mystery and with, with sort of living in a, a condition of not knowing and not needing to know. Yeah, you said it, said it perfectly, the, the second one, yeah. Second one. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's so, and it's like, I, um, I'm constantly surprised, like the sort of a way in which I sort of like imagine that I'm uh, 
like things will be how I imagine them to be. Mm. And then it's like, it's just constantly surprising. Reality is so surprising. Mm. It's, uh, yeah, so mysterious how everything unfolds. Yeah. Um, and when you say reality, um, I know words are always going to be inadequate, but presumably you're talking about experiences that you're having, experiential unfoldings. Um, can, I mean, what sort of unfoldings have the, are, are these? And are, I presume they're continuing, I guess. Uh, is it possible to do justice to them at all with the words or at least give a flavor or a taste, um, an aroma of what it is you're undergoing? Yeah, um, it's sort of like the, the way that we can um, let awareness, like when we let awareness into our experience, we just sort of like, oh, like, like it's almost like a, a kind of prayer, like sort of like, let me know the truth or something like, let me, let me feel what's here. Let me, let this be revealed. Mm. Like this sort of intention of opening. Mm -hmm. And would the word surrender um, do it for you? Sure, yeah, surrender is definitely a big component of that. Yeah, it's like just like dropping any need to um, to be right or good or uh, to know what's here, like intellectually, just sort of dropping like our opinions, our positions, and just like letting ourselves feel what's here. Mm -hmm. and and it, go ahead, continue. Yeah, yeah and just... Um, and the, as awareness touches, it opens. It's like it, it just, it, it, um, like the mind has sort of impressions of what's there and thinks it knows what's there. And it's like as awareness touches it, it just, it feels like it just sort of opens up. Like everything just keeps opening. And keeps opening and keeps opening and keeps opening. In, in other words, sort of like some, some people use the, the phrase uh, free fall forever. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. It's uh, it's it's like um, it's awesome. I mean, it's like I'm I'm awed by it. I'm so grateful, you know, to like for the revelations that mm. that are revealed. And it's and it's like simple stuff. It's just like a, you know, if we go into a feeling in the body, like a feeling in the heart or a feeling in the leg or a feet or whatever. It's mm. like how. Uh, you know, we sort of imagine, oh, I know what's there, it's like tightness or, and it's like, and as awareness starts touching it, if we just sort of drop our, um, our agenda towards it, if we just let it be as it is, it's like it, it uh, we just know it so much more intimately. Mm. It's like there's, uh, mm. you know, there's another sense in which I've, which, I think relates to what you're saying about you know not really appreciating or knowing what this is that we're living in and you know interacting with it's like i saw this youtube video the other day about the size of the universe and they were saying that there are more stars in the known universe than there are grains of sand on all the beaches in the world and then there are more atoms in a single grain of sand than there are stars in the, in the known universe. And if you think about that, single grain of sand, all those atoms, trillions and trillions of them, um, each one of those atoms is like functioning perfectly as atoms should function on all of its subatomic particles and its relationship with all the other atoms in that grain of sand and, and so on. There's is like this, you know, perfectly orderly thing that that is existing in complete accordance with laws of nature that we only partially understand. And then there are these trillions of grains of sand and trillions of planets and stars. I mean, just, I often, I often use this as a sort of a contemplative device to just contemplate the wonder of creation and the fact that, you know, what we're actually witnessing, usually unwittingly, is a display of intelligence so vast that we we can't possibly fathom or comprehend it it's just mind-boggling do you ever play yeah. with those sort of ideas yeah i mean this sort of um like when we open like as wide as vast as we can it's like where's the edge yeah you know like can't where's the edge it. of what we are or what we're in touch with I and mean, we can't find an edge and like, and just as when we go in and we sort of say like, okay, what's that? What's the, like the, 
the the uh, the point of tightness there. Like, what is that? And it's like, and it just it just opens up. It's like it's, there's a whole universe, you know, in, in like apparently nondescript feelings in the body. Mm. Uh, so it's yeah, it's I totally get what you're talking about, and it's the like the direct experience of that. You know how we can just uh, whether we open to the the vastness or if we go deep into something, mm-hmm. it's just it keeps opening in either direction. Yeah, there's a there's a Sanskrit saying which is anor raniyan mahato mahiyan, which is um, smaller than the smallest, greater than the greatest. Mm. It's like in either direction you go, you know, there it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think a lot of people when they hear this thing of openness and you know just letting down your guard and relaxing into the vastness and those kinds of phrases, they they probably feel enticed by that. They think, well, that sounds great, but then they feel that there's kind of a grip. You know, it's like they feel like there's um, some bondage or some some constraints that prevents them from. F- Fully opening, even if they want to. Uh, mm-hmm. How do you address that concern? Yeah, and it's just to like make so much space for that experience, to like to, to meet that experience um, like without any agenda, with so much gentleness. So it's like often, often we um, we meet like experiences we feel things and we're just like that shouldn't be here it's like that just should not like i can see my heart's closed that's not the way it's supposed to be i'm not evolved what's wrong and it's like we just so when when we're looking at what's here when we're exploring what's here it's like we're sort of uh subtly trying to do violence to our experience we're trying to change it Mm. and there's um you know sometimes i'll hear people say like i'm trying to be with it or something I'm trying to accept it and it's like and you can just sort of hear how it's like it I know it shouldn't be here <laughs> yeah it's and it, it's like, like they're to rejecting really, what is yeah yeah and it's like to, and it's um like I've, it's not just a, a belief that this shouldn't be here it's like it's so deeply entrenched in the body it's like this this sort of like rejection of our experience like this like I know there's something bad in here there's something wrong in here there's something wrong with me mm. So it's like when we when we meet that place, it's like just just softening, like as, uh, being as gentle as we can. It's like just letting awareness touch it, just just as it is, without any violence, without any movement to change it. So let's keep digging into this. So to take a more extreme example, let's say someone has been abused or traumatized in some way, or has PTSD from being a, a soldier or something like that. So this, you know, that means that there's a lot of stored impressions or pent up stress or or pain or hurt and um, you know and and a lot of times people with those kinds of problems try to escape it or blot it out with drugs or alcohol or they act it out through violent behavior and so on so um, you know again that's an extreme example but everybody has some degree of this Um, so um, you know how do you defuse that uh, I mean, you, you're talking about gentleness and acceptance, but practically speaking, a person listening to this, you know, somewhere on that scale of severe PTSD to just normal human hang-ups, um, how do they begin to, on a daily basis, unwind and release and free themselves from that kind of load? Yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, it can be very helpful, like, especially if um, we have, uh, like, really severe trauma to have people hold space for us, like to sit with somebody who's able to uh, maintain that uh, sort of representation of awareness, like they're resting in in awareness, Mm -hmm. uh, loving awareness. So, like, uh, and then the connection that we have with the person that's holding space with us sort of can act as an anchor and, and can return us to uh, the sort of benign nature of awareness as we go into difficult places. Mm-hmm. So just, um, so just that, to make sure that's clear, so, you're, so someone like yourself or you know, Pamela Wilson or many of the hundreds of spiritual teachers out there to sit with somebody like that and have them kind of provide a, a ground of being in which you feel comfortable to relax more, something like that. Yeah, like so, um, 
I mean, like when we're when we're exploring, it's like we're letting awareness meet what's here. Like that's ultimately what's happening. It's like a, we're just allowing, like uh, loving awareness, the field that is, mm-hmm. to um, to go to touch these places that uh, you know we we've, we've sort of learned to stay out of that we felt we can't meet, we can't feel. So we're like a letting letting those. Uh, those places in us that we've been buried, that we've contracted around and contorted around, letting them be here, letting them be felt. So um, when we do this, it's very easy. We can notice sort of shame come in. We can notice uh, like the the um, like the sort of agenda of violence to get rid of what's here, to push it away, for to change it. Like it's easy for us to lose that uh, that sort of groundedness in the field to lose contact with uh, awareness itself. So that's the role, so a space holder can help us uh, uh, sort of connect with that space. We, ultimately, nothing's necessary. So like, I mean, the space, the awareness is doing it all. Um, so I'm just saying in some extreme cases, like people have very deep trauma. I mean, space holding can be helpful regardless, but, but uh, for some people, it may not be possible to go there themselves. They may need uh, support. Yeah, and they may just need the opportunity. I mean, their might their life might be a rat race otherwise, and they need to just get a, get away and ha- sit in a quiet place with somebody and settle yeah. in. So, are yeah. you are you kind of suggesting that when they begin to do that, they might begin it might initially um, increase the discomfort because they're beginning to encounter something that was repressed, and that they might without the reassurance and presence of a space holder as you put it uh, recoil from that increased discomfort and just kind of chicken out and get back to distracting themselves somehow yeah yeah I mean it's um, you know when when we open it's like we're um, we're going to meet those places just as you said like what about the people who say they'll feel a grip or they'll feel it closed down it's like we're sort of inviting a, we're inviting awareness to meet those places, like those places mm-hmm. that we have turned away from, that we said we like this part of reality just shouldn't be here, this part of my experience shouldn't be here. And it's like there can be habits of just turning away from that. Like I'm just gonna keep my life small and keep my experiences as minimal as possible because I don't want to run into, you know, keep myself numb so I don't I don't have to feel the stuff that I'm feeling. So it's um, so when we when we sit like with this intention of opening to what's here, it's very normal for difficult things to come up. You know, if we haven't you know had terrible things happen to us, just the normal uh, developmental experiences that we have as human beings typically will have very uncomfortable uh, feelings come up. Mm. It's like these places and us want to be met. It's like, can I be here? Can I be here? You know. <laughs> These places that were damned, that were cursed, that were told to, to go away. And so you probably meet with people maybe once a week or once a month or something like that. Um, do you kind of get them on a routine where they can learn to do this on their own when they're not meeting with you and continue to sort of, you know, dissolve and neutralize this stuff? Yeah, I, f- I find that... Um, it's kind of like an uh, an orientation in the world, like so. So, um, so like once we experience, like wow, actually, like we can meet this stuff. Like we sort of experience the sort of miracle of like what awareness does when it touches these difficult places. When we're able to just just be there and sort of witness the feelings without uh, trying to shut them down or get away from them. It's like once we start realizing what's possible, how we can open, we can be here as we are. It's, um, uh, yeah, like people find this happens in their lives. Like it's just, it just opens more and more space in their lives. And there can be all kinds of practices that support that. In fact, pretty much every spiritual practice is, is supportive of that. Yeah. Um, it's, and, for spiritual practice, I think it's it's really important for people to be um, attuned to what's nourishing them. So rather than sort of like this is the true spiritual practice and everyone must do this, it's like to really notice like what what allows them to open, what feels right, 
Because there's sort of a signature of that opening of, of, uh, of the turn to the truth. Yeah, so you, you kind of find what works for you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, some people love going to kirtan singing, and they, they feel a great deal of openness and, and singing and dancing, and that's a big release for them. And other people like to sit and just meditate quietly, and, you know, and... You know, and we could go on and list a whole bunch of things, and some people like to do a whole potpourri of those, you know, just, you know, kind of a, a toolkit full of different things. Yeah, and I, th I think it's really good to appreciate, like, how there's, there's no true practice. It's all, that's one of the sort of non-dual sayings, right, there's no practice needed. And it's like, so, so given that, like, there's no true practice, so we're not looking for the true practice. It's like to really be engaged with like, what's the react, like, so even when we say like, oh, I'm going to meditate. Mm -hmm. So when we sit, what happens? It's like different every time. It's a unique unfolding. So it's like being alive to what's really happening, what's really going on in our practice, being there for it. There's no like mechanical solution that will get us there. Like if I, if I run this particular practice or if I say these magic words, then, then that, will, that will get me there. It's like it's, it's the, the quality of the presence we bring to our practice, the aliveness. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And you alluded to something like this earlier. Um, but b basically, if, if a person has a spiritual practice, let's say they sit and meditate, and sometimes they have really nice experiences. Now, if those nice experiences cause them to begin to try for those experiences again, rather than just being innocent with, what's happening this you know other time the next time mm. then there's a kind of a habit of manipulation can grow and one can get more and more caught up in that and get very frustrated and um, you know it's quite the opposite of this sort of falling into openness thing that you advocate yeah yeah it's like what's really here it's like it's not so this is another another part of it it's like there's no true practice there's no true experience it's like there's no right experience that we should be having it's like the right experience is the one that's going on right now. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. So it's like, yeah, so like really opening to what's what's true, what's what's really here. Yeah, I think an underlying principle of this also is that um, if our practice is really natural, then it's not, it's not, we're not doing it. You know, it's not like our effort that's making something happen. It's more like a, a cooperation with nature. And, you know, nature knows best sort of how to, how to handle it. And if, if we just get out of the way and, and let nature handle it, then, you know, different things will happen at different times, but it'll be sort of optimally effective. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like the sense of, sort of effortless, the effortlessness of opening. It's like we're not forcing anything to open. Yeah, yeah. It's like we just, we just let awareness do what it does. It's like let it let it touch us, let it move us, let it open things. It's like and just with and it's not on a timetable, so people can again sort of be like, it's not moving, it's not moving, and it's like and it's just like, it's like we just get to sit in whatever the truth is for as long as it wants to be here. Yeah, it's like just completely surrender. There's no there's nowhere to get to anyway. <laughs> Let me take the example of a rose, you know, we're watching it, it's not blooming, it's not blooming. Maybe if I pull this little part off here and <laughs> kind of pull that open, nope, we killed it. <laughs> so you have to just sort of let it bloom in its own time. Maybe you can provide some nourishment or some fertilizer that'll facilitate the process, but it's not going to bloom any faster by your kind of manipulating it from the outside. Or you could use other examples of a, a chick hatching or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's like... Um... Again, to, we, we can become really attuned to that as well. Like, like one of the questions we can ask when we're doing a practice is like, where's the effort? Am I trying to do something? Mm. And it's just to allow that to relax. Again, like not even doing violence to that, like, because we can sort of, oh, I've got to try not to try, you know. But it's like, so we just, we just like, we just notice like, oh, I'm really struggling. Like, I'm really trying to make something. Oops, we just, are you there? Can you can hear me? You hear me? I can now. Yeah. yeah, we had a little hiccup there on the internet. Yeah, but you, you made the point, that was good. Um, I used to be a TM teacher, and, and one of the principles of it was that there, there's a, the mind has a natural tendency to seek a field of greater happiness. And if we just allow that tendency to have its way, then the then we'll naturally sort of settle down and, and you know awareness will expand and so on but any 
inception of individual effort or control or manipulation will only interfere with that. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that's really, uh, it's sort of, yeah, like we're trying to control something. Yeah. It's like we're, we're being invited to open to the mystery, to like open to the great unfolding that's yeah. happening. And it's, and it's like, we're, I mean, there's such a vulnerability in that. You know, we have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> and it's like, and, you know, it's so easy for us to want to like, but I just need it to be this way, or I just need it to be that way. Yeah. And then we try to bring effort, we try to control, we try to manipulate. And it's just, just like a whole, like this, this sort of cycle of suffering starts. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, we just, we just get to, we just get what we're given. You know, we get the experiences that we're given. It's like the universe is just like uh, providing us with all these different experiences, the whole experience of life. And we get to be here for it. That's, that's, uh, we get to open to it. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it bears repeating from various angles. Um, and I don't think you're advocating passivity or, you know, lackadaisicalness or anything like that it's it's uh you know one can be quite um ardent in one's desire for deeper truth and so on but it, that ardency has to be kind of counterbalanced with an an innocence or an effortlessness i, I think that's what you're saying right yeah there's, there's sort of a paradox in there it's yeah, like there's, yeah. there's sort of like there's nothing we need to do you know, it's like, it's, I mean, that can be a really good reminder. It's like when we're sort of like involved in trying to get somewhere or trying to achieve something. It's like, yeah, there's nothing we need to do. We don't need to be anything. We don't need to become anything. And it's like, just sort of like, ah, uh, you know, we get to be here as we are. Yeah. And then at the same time, when we, when we arrive here, when we're, when we're at ease with just as we are, just, just being here, it's like there's the sort of the call of the heart in a way, like our devotion to like what we love. It's like the heart wants to be here, wants to express, it wants to love. Mm. You were talking a few minutes ago about bringing awareness to, you know, this and that that might be noticed in the body or whatever feelings and things. Um, it seems like, let's see what you have to say about this, but it seems like um, people have different capacities of awareness to bring. Uh, some people might be like a little cup and others are like a a big bucket and others like a lake, you know, and others like an ocean. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you had some mud to dissolve, you're going to get different results whether you try to dissolve it in the little cup or in the bucket or in the lake or in the ocean uh, in terms of how polluted the water seems to get when you dump the mud in there. And I don't know whether this analogy is breaking down, but, you know, it's like some people may not feel they have the capacity to deal with the volume of mud that they uh, seem to be encountering or are afraid they're going to encounter and so on. Mm -hmm. And so somehow there has to be this balance between encountering that stuff and increasing one's capacity. And I imagine the more we encounter and, and resolve, the more the capacity expands uh, and therefore the more we can encounter and dissolve. But would you like to comment on that? Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, that uh, uh, sort of point into capacity. And, and the fear that we don't have the capacity. I mean, that's sort of like the, um, in a way, that's sort of the basis of the grip that you were talking about earlier. The way that we can, uh, it's like, oh, I don't want to fall open. You know? yeah. And it's like, we sort of doubt the, our capacity to be here, uh, like our capacity to feel everything that's, that's here to be felt. In a way, we're doubting the capacity of our hearts. And, and as we open, we discover the true capacity of our hearts. It's like, it's like, wow, all of this gets to be met. You know, we, we can actually be here for the whole experience. Yeah, I imagine one could, one, could be in, one could encourage a person by saying, you know, I realize you've been through a lot and you've, you've experienced a lot of trauma and so on. But trust me, if you begin in this process, then, um, you know, you, your ability to sort of be comfortable with it and to, you know, get more and more grounded in openness will grow. It's just a matter of taking the first step. There's, there's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita which says something like, even a little of this practice removes great fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it, when we, when people sit for the first time, sometimes there's a, immediately like discomfort comes up and it's like, I'm doing it wrong. I can't yeah. do this. You know, yeah. it's like out of here, you know? <laughs> so yeah, the, the, um, 
to notice how much we want to turn away from difficult things. It's like, in, in a way, like, why, why are we not just innocently here all the time, you know, fully present, open? Because it's like, well, there's stuff that, we, that comes up that we don't want to feel. And it's like, we just, we just find a way to exit. So like no, starting to notice how we exit. So it might be like leaving the meditation room, but it can, it's also like much more subtle than that. How do we like uh, um, distract ourselves or numb ourselves? Or what do we do when something painful is being felt? Yeah. Like to, and, and often we'll notice like we're actually running. And for many of us, our, like our lives are, are, are like one big sort of like uh, run away from what we're feeling. Yeah. You know, it's just like stay as busy as possible, stay in the mind, just keep recycling the same stories, you know, reassuring ourselves <laughs> that we know what's going yeah. on. It's like George Bush said after 9-11, go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you yourself spend a lot of time in meditation practice and do you still? Yeah, um, yeah, I was uh, very devoted to meditation for many years. Um, uh, now it's a little different for me. Um, I mean, the work I'm doing is sort of meditation. <laughs> like, right. uh, so, so that's uh, one of the beautiful things about doing the work I'm doing is uh, I get to um, sort of be open space for people. Um, and my own practice is, uh, yeah, I still uh, very much sort of like uh, sit down and open to what's going on, explore what's here. Uh, I also do a lot of uh, movement, um, like, uh, just letting the body move how it wants to move. Like tight letting the body kind of move. Thing? It's not. A, it's not like authentic movement. by the closest word for it. So it's like it's really just letting the body do what it wants to do. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of dropping any agenda about like what posture or position or stretches or anything, and just letting the body unfold how it wants to unfold. Yeah. Uh, there's such a sort of, uh, wisdom in the body, like knowing how to move energies and meet things. Mm. So do you advocate among to, to people whom you meet with to uh, you know try to establish some sort of practice where they go into a, a room, shut the door, and sit for 20 minutes twice a day or some such thing, and uh, you know get them into that kind of routine if possible? I'm not a, a big advocate of uh, like pushing practice. Not pushing, uh, but you know, do you encourage? Do you, do you have? Do you say that you know this might be valuable if you could get into the habit of spending quiet time and just you know, closing your eyes and feeling what, however you would, you know, describe it. Yeah, I, um, I'm very hesitant to sit, like, to, I mean, often I won't, I don't really talk about my practice, my personal practices, because they change anyway. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's like, it feels like it's very specific to like, oh, this is what's alive for me now. This is what's helpful for me. This is what I'm, uh, sort of like where the, uh, the juice is, the nourishment is. So I'm like, I'm mining that particular area right now, um, but it's it's very uh, personal. It seems to me like how people relate to practice and uh, like uh, what the sort of uh, yeah like what's going on for them when they practice. So like people can sit and meditate and like they're, all they're doing is like uh, attacking themselves. You know, like I shouldn't be having this. I can't get where I'm going. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, and they're calling it meditation, but of course, like that. Well, you'd not... want to kind of talk them through that, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's um, it's it feels like really important that people are uh, are drawn to practice by their love of the truth. Yeah. In other words, they should be self motivated. They shouldn't feel like obligated or pressured or anything like that. They should just feel inspired themselves yeah yeah because it's it's i mean this this you know practice can really have a dark side to it like where it's sort of like uh i always should be practicing more i should be practicing more i'm not i'm not doing it properly if i was doing it better or i was doing it more then i would get better and and yeah. you know this all this inadequacy this stuff that shouldn't be here all this would be cleared up if i was just doing the proper practice so so i'm very um it's like really awareness is awareness is what liberates awareness does it all so uh for people to be alive in whatever in in however they're uh showing up and uh, alive to what's going on in their lives yeah they're really present for it i was listening to an interview with a guy the other day and he was saying you know a good way uh, a good litmus test for 
any practice is whether you actually enjoy it. So if, if, you, yeah. if you don't enjoy it and you don't feel like doing it, you're probably not going to keep doing it. And you're probably going to create strain if you force yourself to keep doing it. So that, that might be a way of evaluating how effective a practice is for you. Yeah, and it's sort of like, is it, is it um, in alignment with what's true? So we can, like, we can sort of trust our own uh, movement in a way, like what's, what's nourishing us has a signature, it, it feels right. So often, you know, people can end up sort of uh, doing spiritual practices because they believe it's the right thing to do, even though it's not actually nourishing them. A dog is sneezing here. Can you hear? <laughs> yeah, say that again. I was laughing at the dog. Say, say, repeat what you just said. That was good. Yeah, so it's like, it's like we can we can really trust ourselves to know what nourishes, like to to um, to notice like what the experience in our practice is, and and to, we don't need to be sort of captivated by like a belief system about like this is the true practice or this is the right practice or you should be practicing more. It's like to really just notice like what's what's uh, what's yummy, what feels good, what's what's nourishing to us. Yeah, very good. Um, not in a facile way, but like uh, you know, it's even when we when we when awareness touches even the painful stuff, there's like this there's, there's such gratitude just for meeting it. It's like wow, I get to actually feel this. You know, it's like I I get to actually be present. It's like there's a sort of um, a rightness to it, even if it's like not pleasurable, or uh, it just it, there's a way in which we can uh, we like the truth sort of has a signature. Yeah, energetically, it's just like yes, this is this is the right thing to be for to be here for. Do you find in your own experience or in working with people that um, maybe initially there's quite a load to deal with when you start letting awareness touch the painful stuff, to use your phrase? Uh, but that at a certain point, you kind of seem to work through the bulk of it, and then it's kind of downhill from there in terms of downhill in a good sense in terms of just you're sort of working off the the remnants, but you've dealt with the the, the lion's share of it. Um, because otherwise, if that weren't the case, then there might be the prospect of a lifetime of like dealing with heavy stuff, you know, which could be a little discouraging. <laughs> yeah. Um... Maybe it varies tremendously from one person to the next. The way I might characterize it is like, um, it feels like there are layers, like, so there's sort of like gross layers, like, um, of sort of like, uh, you know, like, oh, I'm sort of, I feel all this out of control, uh, anger or grief or whatever it is. And like, and we, you know, we, we start to meet that and then like new layers show up. So like it feels like there's more and more subtle layers of like oh I notice like there's this, there's a kind of holding back from reality you know there's sort of we start to like feel sort of like subtle energetic um, ways in which we distance ways in which we uh, we um, we're, we're not willing to be fully present to our experience so um, so like so certainly some like forms of suffering drop away in my experience uh like and there's more sort of subtle uh sensitivity shows up but it's it doesn't feel like um like oh now i'm free from pain or something in a way it's like we're we're actually like sensitizing ourselves so we like feel uh we can feel everything like at a deeper level mm. So it's not that we're um, we're going to like sort of ascend out of this like uh, uh, realm of pain and pleasure or something like that or, or like uh, feeling deeply or feeling heartbroken. It's sort of like we just realize our capacity for a broken heart. It's like oh, you know, when the heart's open. That's beautifully put. I, th I think. You're are you still there? Okay, I was afraid your internet had frozen up, but you were just standing still. <laughs> um, I love that. Um, and the whole thing of, you know, yeah, cl clearing away the gross and then working your way toward subtler and subtler levels of it, uh, I think is very apt and, uh, and wise. And, and it's not like you're never, it's not like you're going to get to a point where you don't feel things anymore because you've worked through everything. In fact, you might feel things even more acutely. It's not like this, like, this is the program we must be on. It's like uh, it's sort of like coming f like this this uh, this place of like there's nothing we need to do, like, 
And it's like we just let our hearts unfold. So it's like we're, we're called to this by sort of the heart. The heart wants to feel what's here, wants to be alive. We yeah. want to feel all the energy of life. So it's, it's not that like, oh my God, I've got to clear out all this junk and it's like it goes on forever and it's like just endless work. Yeah. It's like it's just, it's like the movement of love. It's like the movement of our hearts. Yeah, nice. It's sort of the natural tendency of life in a way to 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 evolve if you want to use that word and uh, I think it's our I think it personally I think it's the deepest desire of any human being yeah yeah it's like the deepest truth of our heart so it's like so it's really um, I think it's really good to like trust our own hearts yeah. to trust the natural movement because it, we can easily when we hear something like um, somebody's story or like you know my description of falling open or something it's very easy for people to say, oh, I'm supposed to be doing that. Right. What's wrong with my heart? That it's, And it's like there are so many seasons to the spiritual path. So there can be seasons where we're just like hanging out in bliss or yeah. there can be seasons where we're, where, uh, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of different seasons, but it, it's like to listen to where, where our hearts are called, like moment to moment. It's not, um, it's not, we're not trying to force ourselves into some uh, spiritually evolved box or enlightenment box or awakened box. Yeah, it's, it's like to really trust our own unfolding and it's like a different flavor. I mean your your show is a beautiful example of that There are all these hundreds of people uh, involved in opening and and they're all opening in different ways uh, In very different ways with in very different flavors. Yeah, I thought of a metaphor for that the other day I was And that is that no two raindrops reach the ocean by the same path you know mm. all the billions of raindrops that fall they all there there might be some similarities they a lot of them go down this this river or that stream but ultim but really when you look at it every single one of them is unique uh, to some extent often to a great extent in terms of how they reach the ocean yeah yeah that's it's so beautiful yeah yeah and to re to really like and and the sort of the so for people listening to really like the to know that the truth is within you mm -hmm. it's like it's your opening to to the truth that wants to unfold through you it's not you don't have to follow somebody else's story or follow somebody else's guidelines it's like to really listen so even if you're putting yourself in the field of a teacher or something it's like it's like you're listening to your experience with that it's like because your heart is nourished by that experience not because you need to become like them yeah that's important i like to bring I like people to tell their stories when I interview them uh, because a lot of times people feel like, hey, I can relate to that. I, I did that, you know. Uh, I'm a bozo like that guy or whatever, you know. <laughs> um, but it's also important in the same breath to emphasize that it's, you know, it's never going to be the same for you as for anybody else. It, each one is unique. And, and the, I think that gap kind of illustrates that in a way because you just see every week a different flavor and everyone is different and you know there might be some similarities but you know hopefully it drives home the point to people that their own path is as legitimate and as valid as any of these people I interview and uh, that we're just sort of ho hopefully demonstrating that um, ordinary people of every description can arrive at realization or, or deeper truth or whatever you want to call it yeah yeah it's like it's uh it's like awareness is here it's like it's uh it's like what we're made of what the reality is made of so it's 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 i mean that's why the, i love the word falling open the term falling open because it's it's like all we have to, it's like we're it's like there's abiding invitation of reality like yeah. come here be here you know, you're welcome here and it's like it's sort of like this whisper and we're like so busy running around trying to avoid the, <laughs> what we don't want to feel we it's like we're uh, you know we're, we're um we turn away from that whisper we don't listen it's like wait it and we're just being called here you know, yeah our hearts are calling nice. us here it's like diving you know you just get up on the board and you take a correct angle and let go and gravity does the rest yeah yeah um just want to throw something in before we move on there's some nice questions have come in um I interviewed Richard Miller a few weeks ago, who's a psychologist <clears throat> who teaches yoga nidra. Mm. And he happened to mention something which I didn't know, which is that he said that um, the Buddha was said to be kind of doing some sort of spiritual practice all of his life, even after his enlightenment, and to actually be 
processing things that came up, sort of, uh, as you would put it, bringing a awareness to various things that needed attention. And this, this went on all of his life. I've made a new friend in the last week or so named um, Michael Rodriguez, who I'll be interviewing eventually. And he's written this whole thing about post-realization sadhana, uh, mm. you know, which I kind of find that fascinating. So if people think that you know, they're, they're going to have some kind of realization and it's going to be the, the final thing and they'll be done, and that there's you know, no refinement or clarification or resolution of things yet to do, they might be in for a surprise. Yeah, it's almost like a, a lot of um, the sort of, uh, it's like the, the movement away from life, like the attempt to find some fixed position, some fixed experience. So we can often imagine like, oh, awakening or enlightenment or something, that, that's the end of my problem, you know, the problem of me. Yeah. <laughs> The problem of life and it's like it's like actually we're being called to be fully alive like to be here more to be uh to be like in the flow of this unfolding so it's not that we're um we're supposed to arrive at a fixed destination a fixed point it's like we're actually uh called to open to this uh this this space that's not fixed that's constantly uh flowing through us yeah nice all right, let me ask a few questions that have come in. Um, this is a little bit of a long one, but I think it looks like it's pretty good. Um, this is from uh, Margaret in San Francisco, and she asks, Dear Adam, please could you reflect on a major human challenge I'm facing, pertinent to both personal and massive global issues, in whatever way clarity moves through you. Um, I'm deeply struggling with the fact that much of my daily human existence depends on infrastructures that are deeply destructive to the natural environment as well as that contribute regularly to governmental decisions to wage war and murder innocent people, to secure lands with oil, for instance, to maintain our consumeristic economy, etc. So my inner response is clear and comes from love, a sense of clear urgency to take steps I can to adjust my life choices to more sustainable ones, as well as urgency to be as awake as possible so life can move through me in whatever healing, balancing ways she deems best. At the same time, I have major murky pain body response, guilt, shame, self-loathing, uh, both, both at all the ways I do not feel capable of changing my life, nor being an activist in the world, as well as shame at how unawake I am, despite seeing through the mind illusion repeatedly. I still live in what feels like a constant haze of mind addiction and mind decisions much of the time. Um, so, looks like, let's see, uh, oh, okay, that's a separate question. Um, yeah, go ahead and, deal, and answer that one. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah, shame is, feels like it's, it's, in a way, it's like the sort of antithesis of, uh, like the openness it's it's like in many in most cases it feels like that's the sort of the block in the door you know it's like uh like this belief there's really something bad here like there's something wrong inside me uh there's, there's stuff that's here that just shouldn't be here it's like and you know again i don't want to it's not a simple like just believe something different it's like it's so in the body like to, to sort of reject this you know, it's like it's probably been mirrored to us when we were younger by by uh, caregivers, and we. It's like a really visceral, like this should not be here. You know, like this is so obviously wrong. So it's like to to really soften to, like we can't be tender enough with these places that have been so harshed upon, so uh, abandoned. So to to let ourselves feel that like the whole truth of our experience. And to, to feel the pain that, that lives, uh, sort of, like the, the pain of the shame and the, and the pain that lives behind there as well. Yeah. And um, I, I would also say to her that, um, you know, we live in a, a world that, in which many things are not ideal. Uh, you know, the types of, with the ways we get energy and the ways we get food and, and all kinds of things like that. And... You know, we can do certain amount within our own lives to try to live in a more enlightened way, a more sustainable way. But 
it's always going to be less than the ideal at this stage of the game. And, and uh, you know, don't beat yourself up too badly over it. Just do what you can and do what you can to... I just, just this morning I heard some beautiful saying, which is, I forget exactly how it was worded, but you, everyone knows the principle, and that is that if you want to change the world, change yourself. And, uh, you know, who was it? I think it might have been Gandhi or somebody who said, you know, it's easier to wear shoes than it is to pave the earth in leather. Um, so it doesn't mean we shouldn't um, do what we can to change the world, but I think that the greatest leverage we have is self-transformation in whatever way we understand that. And that, you know, by really transforming in a significant way, we're, we're making a tremendous contribution to a, a better world. Yeah, I'd like to, so the, this, um, this shame that the questioner was talking about, it's like that, that's like the violence, you know, it's like that, that belief that like I shouldn't be the way that I am, like there's something wrong with me that needs correcting, needs forcing, needs uh, to be, to be rid of. And it's like, and that's, uh, like that's manifest in the world. It's like that's that violence that we need to get rid of the bad people, you know, we need to get rid of the bad things. And it's like, and we're bringing that, uh, that sort of energy of violence to everything. So, um, so it's like the softening, the feeling, the sense, becoming sensitive to like what the truth of our experience is, letting it all be as it is. Yeah. It's, uh, it's like the, it's like that's how this, this sort of, the cycle of violence comes to an end. It's like when we, when we meet the truth of it. I was listening to a um, interview this morning. It was actually a panel discussion from the Science and Non-Duality Conference with uh, Peter Russell and Elizabeth Satoris and Drew Dellinger and uh, I forget who else, another guy. And um, one, of the, one of the participants or panelists was saying that, um, or maybe it was an audience member asking a question, that there are certain things which psychologists say are just un healable through any kind of psychological method, like pedophilia, for instance. They were saying, you know, if, if you're a pedophile, you just don't get over it through anything that psychology has to offer. Um, do you feel that um, through your approach, or some approach, <laughs> of a spiritual nature, um, someone with really incorrigible behavior of some sort, uh, can actually be freed from it, or you know, can can uh, you know, a real scoundrel doing terrible things can actually rise beyond the possibility of behaving that way anymore. Yeah, I mean, I I, um, I don't see any point in holding the the opposing uh, like viewpoint, the belief that like it's it has to you know like I'm always going to be this way. I, in a way, that's that's. Um, like the sort of hopelessness about ourselves, like, oh, I'm, I just, this is just how I am. I'm always going to like do these messed up things. It's like, uh, I'm always going to, I'm always going to turn away from my experience. I'm always going to run from this particular thing. And it's like, when we actually open, we start to realize that, wow, actually this stuff can be met. It's just feelings in the body. It's sensations, it's energies. It's like, it can be met. And actually when we meet it with, with nonviolence, it like comes into harmony. So do you feel like a, a behavioral tendency such as pedophilia, for instance, um, actually, if you get right down to its core, it can be located as some sensation in the body um, that is the, at the root of such a tendency, and that by somehow feeling and healing that sensation, one would find that the behavioral tendency dissipates or disappears? Yeah, I mean, if if we're sen as we become more sensitive to what's going on, it just feels like our our actions just naturally come into alignment. I mean, when we when we feel like the harm we do to people, when we start to like become aware of that, like to take in their experience, it's like it just breaks our hearts. It's like, oh, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to use a harsh tone. I don't want to uh, you know tell vibe that this person should be different than they are. I mean, we can we can just feel how that, uh, like the, yeah, like it doesn't feel good. Have you ever considered going into a prison and and kind of working with some of the people there? 
No, I haven't really, no. No. It's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I just sort of go where I'm called, where I'm right. invited, and yeah. yeah. No. Folsom will be calling soon. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, here's another short question that came in, and I, I don't I have a feeling how you're going to answer this, but let me just ask it. Sean from Illinois, might have been one of your own old buddies from Macomb, asks, uh, if you could give someone just one suggestion or piece of spiritual guidance, what would it be? Hmm. Well, I have no idea. Yeah, it totally depends on who it is. I had a feeling uh, you'd say something like that. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess this... Um, yeah, I don't know that I want to land on one, actually. Yeah. No, I'm getting rid you know of You know how I'd answer that one? I would say, seek and you shall find, you know? I mean, mm. if you have the motivation to do something, just sort of keep favoring that tendency, that motivation, and various opportunities and options will present themselves to you. Mm -hmm. Nature is very responsive. Um, you know, I was discussing this, I think it was last week with Chris Celine, that there's so many examples of people who just, once they put out the petition to the universe, so to speak, put out the call, of, hey, I'm, I'm tired of the same old, same old, and I really want to know what's true and what's real, you get tremendous response um, from, from the universe, from nature, and uh, all kinds of opportunities present themselves. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, I mean, like, radical transformation is possible. I mean, like, uh, you know, I sometimes sort of joke about, like, you know, years ago being past lives i mean it's just like yeah. I, I don't it's like half me didn't remember person? how i was then it's like yeah. wow what's going on how was it to, to live in that body in that in that worldview and um it's almost like shedding a skin or something it's like it's just a totally different universe it's a totally different experience and and in my experience it's actually accelerated it feels like there have been several of these and it's sort of like wow what was it like 18 months ago <laughs> it's, like, it's like hard to remember because so much has shifted yeah so it's um yeah like yeah we it's it's really so different than we think it is this is just so different good um here's a question from um connor in jefferson colorado connor asks oh, hello adam your presence is very warm i have a question for you when falling into the depth and beauty of here, non-dimensional peace, often the mind rises in reverence and love for the gravity of this beauty. I tend to spin out from there, alternatively. The gravity of not knowing what I am or what anything is tends to ignite narration. If you could speak to this, I would be very grateful. Hmm. Narration. I think maybe he starts to put a story on it or something right yeah. right yeah yeah so it's uh, like really getting i mean there's hmm. so there's no story to land on there's nothing to figure out there's no like truth of this that we're going to capture in words like so so there's no um there's no importance to like the uh the symbolization of this in a way like we're not trying to land on a particular model of the universe or a description or a philosophy or anything like that. So, so like really just uh, letting that come to rest. Like I don't know is sort of like the the height of wisdom when it comes to uh, to being present to the truth. And having said that, um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with expressing the truth. It's like uh, sort of like we, like, uh, like it's sort of like poetry. Like we just see it as like art. We can see the we can see the impossibility of giving words to the experience, like that that are accurate, that are complete, and and yet uh, it can be beautiful to express, and it can be evocative, and it can be helpful. Uh, so it's just it's like the the trick is like not believing the words. You know, like not believing that like oh now i've given the comprehensive definition of enlightenment or life or you know <laughs> the universe it out. Yeah. yeah you went through a phase where you were reading a lot of spiritual books and 
thinking about things and all. Um, do you find that you still enjoy reading spiritual books and stuff, or have you kind of lost all interest in that? Yeah, it's really dropped away. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I first started having these, um, you know, had these sort of openings with psychedelics, I then became very interested in people who are writing about uh, um, spirituality and psychedelic experiences, but sort of that it gradually went into meditation and spirituality. Um, and the sort of uh, like looking for clues as to, um, you know, what, what the hell's going on here? You know, what is this about? Yeah. So you do some retreats with Jeannie Zandi, huh? You, you, you still do or you have done? Yeah. Um, yeah, I went on a retreat with her in January. It was mm -hmm. the last one. Um, I'm not taking her upcoming program, but I've been really involved with her work uh, for like the last three years. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just been... Uh, Yes, uh, incredibly powerful, transformative uh, teacher for me. Yeah, I've met Jeannie, and we every every year or two we talk about, hey, we should do an interview one of these days. And then she always says something. Yeah, well, I think I'm gonna get my website more together first. So she's <laughs> she's in no hurry. But one of these days, I'll interview Jeannie. She's nice. Yeah, yeah. And um, but so the reason I brought that up is that you mentioned in your bio that um, you know it's very heart centered. Her her whole teaching and um, heart-centered and full-bodied. And a lot of times um, non-duality is not presented in a very heart-centered way. You know, there isn't a lot of flavor of heart. It seems to be kind of heady or mm. sort of transcend transcendental, you know, just sort of absolute, abstract. There's no person, that kind of thing. Um, and s But you seem like a fairly heart-centered guy. And um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about what that means for you, being heart-centered as well as being non-dual, and whether there's any sort of... I mean, some people might see a contradiction in that. I don't, mm. but, uh, and probably mm. you don't, but let's let's talk about that for a bit. Yeah, for, I mean, I sort of maybe talk about it in two, like the sort of the mind falling open and the heart falling open, and for me there, was, there were sort of like two different experiences in a way. Mm. Um, and in, in both cases, it's like it's a return to naturalness, our natural state. So in the in the first one with the mind falling open, it's like just giving up this this uh, this hope that we're going to know or this effort to try to know, like to try to capture uh, with the mind what the truth is, you know, like to figure out what the true practice or what the true teaching or what's really going on here. It's like just really getting like it's this is so vast, so open, so subtle totally uncapturable in words. Any words are always partial, always uh, you know, putting meaning on this that is prior to meaning. So just really like letting go of that and letting, letting ourselves be here like, wow, what is this? You know, just like this open, innocent presence. Uh, and it, 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 you can sort of feel the mind relax when that, when that happens. It's like, wow, I just get to be, I don't have to know anything. I don't have to show up with like my theory of the universe, my theory of what I am. I can just be here as I am, you know, whatever that is. And then the uh, the heart falling open is, uh, yeah, I sort of experience it often as like a softening, like uh, just um, yeah, just like letting awareness like uh, touch everything that's here, just like uh, like all the way into the body, all the way into like the sort. Of, the deepest uh, parts of uh, of what's here. Just like um, it's like the awareness has such a gentle touch. It's like there's no violence in it. It's just like even when it's like touching the most tender, sort of like agonizing, heartbreaking. It's just like it's like this just sort of like wind blowing over a wound or something. It's like it's so uh, so sweet in a way. Um, so it's like just that uh, that open into the vulnerability, the sensitivity, letting ourselves be here, uh, feeling everything that's here. And not, yeah, like, um, yeah, letting the, the defenses fall away, just letting them, letting them melt in their own time. As you know, you know, bhakti is a major aspect of, spirit, of the spiritual um, repertoire that, you know, many people are oriented around. Um, and bhakti means devotion. Do you, do you find that, or love, to put it more simply, mm. uh, 
do you do you find that you know in, in terms of the heart opening thing that you you were just describing <clears throat> that that has resulted for you in um, much more profound experience of love or devotion or you know, yeah. reverence things like yeah. that yeah yeah it's like uh it feels like it's just a natural consequence of intimacy, you know, like intimacy of what is. It's like this, uh, yeah, like it's just uh, uh, awesome. Uh, you know, like to, to know the truth of our hearts, you know, like to even get a sort of a little taste of it. It's like, it's so beautiful. It's like, wow, you know, it's like so not what, we, uh, what we've been taught. You know, we've been taught we're not right and we've got to get good. And, and it's like, and our hearts are so beautiful, so precious. Do you feel a, a kind of a sense of God? I mean, what is, what is your mm -hmm. thought of God? Your, your feeling, your orientation toward whatever God may be, however you may conceive or understand God to be? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm really, uh, I find that I'm very playful sort of in the way that I describe reality and the way that I use metaphors and uh, so like I'm, again, like I'm not holding any like uh, sort of conceptual map of like what's going on, like oh there's the heart and then there's the God speaks to the heart and then yeah. the heart, you know, it's like there's nothing like that. But, but, um, but like the way some people refer to the word God resonates deeply, it's like this, uh, this sort of surrendered to uh, to what's here, like the 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 vastness of what's here, the the lack of any uh, means of controlling what's unfolding, um, the the way that everything is just being given to us, like reality is like giving us uh, every moment, every experience, every uh, everything that's here. Yeah. Well, like if you're out walking in a beautiful place, like walking in the redwoods or something in Northern California, you know, or on the beach or something, do you sometimes find yourself feeling a, a sense of kind of devotion or adoration for the divine intelligence that seems to be behind this or orchestrating this, this beautiful play? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find I find myself touched uh, deeply by by uh, yeah so much of uh, my experience yeah it's, um, yeah there are so many different aspects to it you know it's like uh, like you know sitting with people and just being touched by their experience like the uh, yeah the be the beauty of um, you know their hearts and the, uh, even the suffering it's like so beautiful mm. and um, yeah, and this, and this sort of sense of vastness. I mean, like, how uh, magical is this? You know, just the uh, the way that this is unfolding is it is so mysterious and so deep, and um, there are just so many endless layers to it. It's like unfathomable. Yeah, nice. Um, here's a question that came in from Chris in the UK. Hi, Adam. When are you coming home? No. Hi, Adam. If, if you notice a grasping in meditation, would you advise just opening up to the grasping at the level of the body in a loving way? Mm, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, really. It's like to meet whatever's here with love. I find like the sort of invitation to meet with love is like so helpful when, when, we're, uh, when we're in the sort of uh, the place where it's like we're just totally convinced this shouldn't be here you know like i'm doing it wrong it shouldn't be here i shouldn't be having this experience this is so not what an evolved person has <laughs> <laughs> and it's like just to have such compassion for it. it's like ah, oh, i you know this is the experience that's here yeah this is the experience that's here we get to feel this mm. there was a song by george harrison which obviously he didn't coin the phrase but it was this too shall pass mm. you know and uh I would say that if a person feels like they're sort of hitting a rough patch in meditation or in life or whatever, keep that phrase in mind. Yeah, and and to to be um, like curious about what's here, not not to try to figure it out, like uh, why is it here and what I need to do with it, but just like what's the feel of it, like what's the what's the most intense point of it, 
like uh, what what hurts the most about this? You know, like like really like going to exactly the place where we're trying to squirm away. You know, where we're like this shouldn't be here. This shouldn't. Be. It's like really like what's uh, like what's the most excruciating part of this experience? Like really like allowing awareness to to explore that territory. Mm. It's like what what is it I don't want to feel that's here? It's like these sort of inquiry questions can be really helpful. Just uh, just sort of like pointing us towards the truth, like the place that we always run from, that we just like skip over and try to ignore and deny and repress. It's like, let's just turn towards that. Like, what is that? What is this place that I've been taught to escape from, to not, to not be present to? And in doing that, um, would you say, as a principle, general principle, that any sort of emotional or psychological or, you know, thing that we might be going through does have a physiological correlate and that you can, you know, the best way of dealing with and resolving these kinds of things, let's say some strong feelings of anger or fear or whatever, is to allow yourself to locate, you know, to allow your awareness to locate the physiological correlate to that and dwell on that rather than sort of playing, playing mm -hmm. around in the fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's like to go to, go to like the um, like the deepest place, you know, so like, so typically when, when we notice an active mind, it's because there's stuff that like, we don't want to feel like we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to like get away or solve a problem or we, like make it sort of something mental mm -hmm. that we can, uh, we can grapple with in the mind. Cause it's sort of like, it's a numb sort of fuzzy, like, so when we go into like, the, like what's, what's actually been felt in the body, what's the energy that's here? What's the uh, the sensations that are here? It's like it's, it's just like a deeper level. We can sort of feel how it's like. Wow, this is not what I imagined. You know, this is not what I thought it was. You know, the mind's like trying to solve some problem that doesn't even exist, and it's like it's like oh, this, there's energies here that want to be felt. Yeah. So are you saying? I think you're saying that um, the mind might come up with rationales for some kind of fear or, or some sort of thing that's being felt, which actually have nothing to do with the root of that feeling. They're just, the mind's just fabricating something because it doesn't like to have a feeling without some kind of rationale. Yeah. <laughs> and that yeah. you can, if you can kind of settle beneath that and get down to the core feeling, which is rooted in the physiology at some point, then you can, you can really root it out. Yeah. Yeah, it's like we, when we feel fear in the body, typically the mind wants to goes out and like looks for something to be fearful about. Yeah, it's like um, it could be so one we, thing or another. It could be any number of a dozen things, but it's not that. Right. Well, it'll just project out. So it's like, oh, that's that's I've got to like that's the problem. If I can just solve that, then I won't have fear anymore. Right. And it's like as soon as that's gone, then there'll be something else. You know. Yeah. So it's like to. So yeah, like meeting the, the actual experience of the energy in the body. And often fear is really just uh, like, it's, um, it's sort of like we, it's something we don't want to feel. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like an energy that's uncomfortable or painful or it's, uh, it's like there's nothing really to it. Like we imagine there's something like it, it, uh, it means there's some, uh, there's some serious problem here. You know, there's really something wrong here. But it actually doesn't. It's just like an energy in the body. Mm. I think the same could be said of cravings, like, you know, I need cigarettes, or I need food, or I need this or that. Uh, and it's, it's really, um, there's a, a physiological sensation can be located and dealt with on that level. Uh, and if it is, the craving can just dissipate. You know, mm -hmm. rather, yeah. rather than sort of directing the attention outwards and trying to consume the thing that the craving seems to be wanting. Right, right. Yeah, and it's like, to, again, to really let awareness do, do its work. You know, so it's like we just sort of, we just point ourselves towards the stuff that, uh, that we've been turning away from and we just let awareness touch it, let awareness reveal uh, the experience. Like we, you know, when we're in the mind and the mind's version of what's happening, it's like it's so far removed from like what's actually going on. Mm. You know, we think like, oh, I want a cigarette or I want chocolate or something <laughs> because, you know, and it's like, and then when we start feeling into the body, it's like all kinds of stuff's there. 
it's like it's a whole different universe so yeah. it's a different level of reality interesting so it's like is it in a way the body is sort of a portal to freedom it's it's uh, mm. it, it sort of tells us oh who was it mary o'malley that i interviewed a while back and and uh, I, I just got an email from someone about her the other day, but she has this phrase, um, I forget how it goes exactly, but it's, it's sort of like that which appears to be the obstacle or the problem is actually the opportunity, you know, to resolve something. Yeah, it's beautiful, yeah. And the, the, um, it's like any time we notice, like, uh, this shouldn't be here, this shouldn't be this way, it's like that's the opportunity, like, what, what, what's being felt there? Let, let me feel this place that I've condemned, you know, yeah. as I've been taught to condemn. And it's, um, you know, even when we say the body, it's like, what is the body? Because the mind thinks it knows what a body is, you know, it has an image of the body and it calls it, you know, this is the body. But it's like when we actually, like, let awareness touch what's here, it's like, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's not at all what the mind imagines. Yeah, it's Again, not... there are so many layers. Yeah. <laughs> You know, when you said that, you said, what is the body? I kind of flashed on, you know, the perspective of physics as to what the body is, which is essentially empty space, you know, with some virtual particles bubbling around. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, ultimately, it's not this flesh and blood thing. If we get right down to it, it it's sort of a, an energy field or, a, a, you know, an accretion of, of probabilities or something. And, and <laughs> uh, so... Uh, and, as such, it's not etched in stone, it's malleable. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard the word, you know, um, what is it, neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, where anything in the, not only the brain, but the nervous system um, is plastic, it's malleable, it's changeable, it, it's uh, healable. Yeah, and I mean, this is, this is uh, so my experience, I mean, the, the uh, we can we can um, have a totally different experience of reality, and like, and it's not even it, when I say this is not like you know five years from now you can have a totally different experience of reality. It's like just turning towards reality. It's like everything shifts. Yeah, you know, it's like it's it's just uh, it's like not at all what we imagined. It's like it's, it's uh, it opens up. Nice. Here's another question. This is from Scott in Half Moon Bay, California. After having a major spiritual opening, why would I find myself being drawn back into old bad habits, such as drinking again for the first time in 15 years? And that's a mm -hmm. practical question. Good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask follow-up questions with these. <laughs> You're welcome to. I mean, yeah, you can yeah. you can say something, and the person can send in another follow up thing if you want. If we have, if we go along. I mean, it, it's you know, if if I'm working with somebody, I would I would like really be curious about like what's going on, sort mm -hmm. of. Uh, so I'm 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 going to like sort of just guess, you know, like I mean, it right. feels very. So that, yeah, this is actually something I'd like to talk about maybe. Um, like when I sit with someone, it's not like I know what the truth is and you don't know what the truth is. It's like you have the sort of inside seat on like experience, like the reality that's unfolding in you, through you. And uh, so I'm, I'm like um, supporting awareness, uh, exploring what's there, opening what's there. So that's what I would do in this case with with someone who said who comes in and says uh, says that sort of question like why would this be happening? Mm -hmm. It's like we'll explore what's going on. Um, uh, I mean, just to sort of conjecture, <laughs> like, and uh, yeah, uh, I'd be very happy for uh, the person I was sitting with to say no, that's not it. There's nothing like that. Um, it does feel like there's sort of an adjustment to opening. So it's like um, when we have like a big sort of like radical opening, often like we want to contract tight again. Like it's just like, it's like it's, we're just not prepared to, to have all that energy to be this wide open in an ongoing way. So it's sort of, it feels like there's a sort of, uh, and what's the word? 
like an acclimatization to openness. Yeah, yeah. So like we open and, and it becomes more possible. A bit like you were talking about with the, the cup gets bigger. Right. Like the resource that we have to be open. It's like we just, and there can be, it's very normal for there to be opening and closing. Like it's sort of a, a natural rhythm. And we just, we just get to sort of realize like how wide open we can be, you know, how vast we are, how much capacity there is here. And it just, it, again, it just grows so organically. It's like the flower blooming that you're talking about. It's not something we have to force or, um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll just throw in that, um, you know, you were saying earlier about sort of the strata or deep, deeper layers of impressions that we might work through as we go along. Um, you know, there could be stuff that's sort of built into our makeup that um, is just peacefully slumbering and, you know, it has kind of like, it's not being, it's not caused any problems, it's kind of like a, a sleeping elephant or something, it's just lying mm -hmm. there sleeping. And uh, then we have a big opening and that opening, I would say, it, it, in a way it wants to be sustained. We, we want to have a, a kind of a we don't want these openings to just be sort of flashes in the pan. It would be nice to sort of live that way in an, an abiding way. Uh, but it may be that there's a lot of stuff lodged in our physiology and our subtle body, however we want to understand it, that is really not compatible with living in that open way. And now that we've had an opening, the time has come for stuff that was slumbering to kind of wake up and be cleared out. And, uh, mm. and so there might be an old habit or an old tendency or an old thing that we thought we had put behind us years ago that is sort of sprouting up again. And I mean, maybe you t tell me if I'm wrong, but as, as if you were working with Scott, uh, you might sit with him and have him kind of go into whatever deep sensation or feeling seems to be associated with this desire to drink again you know there, mu there must be something there which could be discovered and perhaps resolved without recourse to alcohol yeah and um yeah yeah and just to to, to really be innocent about the exploration so it's very easy when when we notice a behavior like oh i shouldn't drink or i shouldn't watch tv or whatever it is mm -hmm. It's like to be very sort of harsh and we've got to like attack, the, we've got to find the solution and go in there and sort it out. And it's like to, to really be, uh, to let awareness like innocently reveal what's there. It's like um, to, to not know in advance that like, uh, you know, we should not be drinking or we should not be watching TV or whatever. It's like to really just like explore like what is here, what's, that? what's the actual experience? So with, that, with no condemnation, no, uh, you know, we've got to kill this off or stop this, but just like really feeling in like what's, what's actually going on here? What is our experience? It's like the truth will, will liberate us anyway. It, it will, uh, and, and again, the path can be so, um, you know, there can be different seasons. You know, it may be the season for closing down right now, you know, after a big opening. So, it's, so there's no violence to it. There's no like, we've got to force you open. We've got to like change what you're doing or something. It's like, it's really just letting awareness uh, do its work. Yeah, that's nice. It's very, very compassionate way of putting it. I mean, guilt tripping yourself over it is, is obviously not going to help. And uh, I mean, if, if a person had a serious problem, maybe they need to go to AA or something as a support group for, you know, what they're going through. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if if you're sort of like burning down your house or something, then it's like you know, well, let's let's put down the torch and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but you know, if you're just watching a lot more TV than you think is good for you, you know, we can we can just be really gentle about that and explore what's going on. Yeah, yeah. just don't do it with a lot of beer. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, here's a question from Marin in Portland, Oregon. She asks. Uh, I see the brain as an organ and, and the mind as something else entirely. I also understand PTSD as an event that injures an organ of the body, the brain, in addition to having effect on the mind. How does awareness heal the brain if it does? Hmm. 
Yeah, I, I tend to like to speak just from my own direct experience. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just noticed that uh, there's, uh, you know, I've, I've been hurt. There's there's reasons why, you know, that my body uh, contorted and closed down and numbed out and uh, distanced from the heart. I mean, when I was involved in that philosophy, I had no idea what love was or what my heart was. I mean, I was like, oh, I'll give you a theory of what love is or something. You know, it was like total BS. I mean, nothing nothing connected to the direct experience of love. Um, so it's, uh, so there's, you know, the stuff that was, was there, you know, like that had been put there uh, for a reason, uh, you know, because of whatever experiences I had when I was younger. And, and again, I, I didn't have like deeply traumatic experiences, but I had, you know, a normal human sort of upbringing. Uh, with imperfect parents and imperfect environment and so on and uh and this this stuff does heal it can fall away i mean it's it's uh i feel so blessed so grateful for uh the gift of opening that's yeah. happened um and uh, just to Marin's question that you know there is definitely a correlation between mind and body. I mean, that's pretty well established in scientific circles and between behavior and brain also. I mean, they've done MRIs, you know, and, uh, on people who have certain types of criminal behavior chronically and they find that there are actual sort of functional holes in their brain in terms of, um, you know, in terms of brain activity. Certain th things are, are more shut down than in the average person. And, uh, and there have been studies on, you know, various kinds of meditation showing that those functional holes, so to speak, can be healed and can be re-enlivened and, you know, brought back to sort of normalcy and consequently that, that behavior changes. So, you know, it's an interesting area and there, there are researchers who are working on this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, everything's interconnected. There's nothing separate in the universe. Mm, yeah. uh, everything's affecting everything all the time. Yeah. Um, here's a question, and Dan, who sends me the question, says, location not given, but it's a lovely question. So here's a lovely question. Um, hello, Adam. You mentioned that you practice something like authentic movement. What advice would you give for someone who would like to start opening up to their bodies, intel their own body's intelligence? Mm. Mm. Um... Yeah, I mean, it's it's really like uh, the invitation to let awareness into the body, and um, so I'll, I guess I'll I'll just describe like what I do, um, which was taught to me by Jeannie Sandy. Oh, okay. Um, which is uh, I'll just uh, close my eyes and uh, let my body uh, move however it wants to move, and I'll keep my eyes closed for the entire period. Would you be like and standing up in the middle of the room or something or sitting? Could or? be, could be lying down, could be yeah. sitting. The body will just move however it wants to move. So mm -hmm. it's, it's different every time. And, uh, and yeah, and just, and just letting myself like just be completely immersed in the experience of the body, the feel of the body and just letting it, uh, letting it move as it wants to, letting it be still when it wants to. So if we were to watch a videotape of you doing that, what would we see? <laughs> It totally depends. You'd be like totally dancing around the room, or just, <laughs> you know, gesticulating in different ways. <laughs> it, yeah, this uh, it can be. It can be entirely. Yeah, there's so many different ways. Like so, uh, I could be lying on my back, like yawning, like not moving hardly at all. Mm -hmm. I could be uh, doing all kinds of poses that look a bit like uh, prayer or yoga or something or tai chi. Um, but it's like, but there's no, it's not coming from the mind. The movement is not like, oh, I should stretch out my legs or oh, I should do that. It's like, it's just like really being in the body and letting the body like lead. So just letting the body do whatever it wants to do, letting myself be surprised by what it does. Mm. I mean, it just does uh, crazy things. I mean, it's like, like the weirdest sort of stretches and contortions. And you're just like, well, you know. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I've heard stories of people having like Kundalini awakenings and then without really knowing much about yoga or anything, spontaneously going into various yoga postures. And some, some may actually speculate that that's how the yoga postures got developed. Through kind of, it, wasn't, it wasn't like, well, let's see what my body can do, but it's more like the body was, some yogi's body was spontaneously going into these positions and 
took note of it, you know. Yeah, it feels like that's sort of what all the practices around the body, like Tai Chi and Qigong and yoga and so on, they're sort of like pointing us uh, to that, like the the aliveness of the body, like the way the body, uh, the body's intelligence, the body's wisdom. Yeah. So let's see here. I read a bunch of your essays that you recommend. Is there anything uh, in them that we haven't covered that would be interesting to touch upon? Um, Mostly, we've talked about all this stuff. Um, here's one that we didn't talk about, I don't think. Um, only the dropping away of the fear of loneliness makes us truly available for intimacy. Now we are free to open to others because we don't need anything from them. It's kind of an mm. interesting point. Mm. What would you say to that? Anything? Yeah. Um... Just the, just the, like uh, I think early on in the essay, maybe I was just just like to be really uh, gentle about the feelings we have about uh, you know being rejected or feeling lonely or unloved or unwanted or unworthy. It's like this is sort of like an, I mean, we could call this sort of the core wound in a way. Like many of us have a place like this, and it's like to just. Uh, you know, the sentence you read just sounds a little sort of like, yeah, we've got to get rid of that. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, yeah, to just be so gentle, to really let ourselves feel that place. And, uh, and like, it's not, it's not wrong that we, that we have this, uh, this feeling, like this was put, put here, you know, this is the way we, uh, we coped with our early experiences. And, uh, and when we, when we act from like trying to get rid of that by like uh, grabbing a hold of a partner or like um, you know trying to like have as many friends as we can have or something, um, it's like we're uh, like j just to see how that that, that wound is not. Um, uh, it's like when we have to let awareness touch that, we have to turn towards that experience. Like it's not there's nothing out there that's going to. Uh, take care of that that's going to fulfill it satisfy it heal it yeah interesting point i guess another way of putting it is that if we're kind of empty within ourselves nothing outside of us and no one outside of us is going to be able to fill that emptiness you know and and any relationship we get into if if we're empty and the other person is empty that's like neither person is in a position to give both are, are kind of in taking mode and no and therefore nobody give gets because nobody gives <laughs> right right but if yeah. we're full within ourselves, my cup runneth over kind of thing uh, and if the other person is then obviously that could be a very very different experience yeah and and again i just um you know i'm always really like attuned to the way that um we can condemn ourselves you know, so it's like, so I, I really hate for someone listening to this to think that like uh, that what we're saying is like we have to be uh, full of love and light and cleaned out entirely before we engage in a relationship right. or that uh, that we're only doing harm to other people by the way that we're loving them or something like that. So yeah. so it's like, you know, most of us have this place, some some form of this, some some way that we're thrown into this by particular events, you know, if a partner leaves us or something, it often like is a direct line to this pain. Um, so it's like really being so gentle, so compassionate with this place and and uh, and giving it the loving awareness that uh, that it wants, that it's like asking for. That's nice. I think if we were to summarize this whole interview is to summarize you in a couple of words it would be gentleness and compassion I mean you, your your whole persona really exudes those qualities mm. <laughs> which mm. is nice and you know that I mean those are beautiful qualities to have and it also kind of you know summarizes your teaching you know that you just have this real gentle compassionate non manipulative approach which is refreshing yeah, and I just just say that like so the experience here is like that this is just like the it's like what the universe wants to do do through me. Yeah. It's like it's not uh, it's not like I'm trying to be loving or something. It's like it's like this is uh, this is how awareness appears to me. You know, like it's sort of this is the way that it's like it's 
it's so amazingly gentle. It's like, uh, you know, we often, often gentle, even as a child, like, were you like r really kind to animals and, you know, just <laughs> you didn't bully the, your friends at school or anything like that. You've just always been a gentle mm. guy or, or did you really transform into a more gentle person? Yeah, when I was a child, I think I was fairly gentle, but I mean, I was, uh, um, I had sort of a, uh, when I was a teenager and the years after that, I mean, there was kind of a, uh, a harshness in my, my tone and like the, especially with the sort of political debate and so on, I was very like, you know, yeah. uh, uh, like, I don't understand why you're crying. I'm just like being rational, you know, so like, <laughs> <laughs> just like very identified with the text and not really like attending to like what's actually being felt or what's the sort of energy that's vibing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really, really kind of shut down to that, that aspect of reality. So it's, um, it's something that's I've sort of become resensitized to. Um, yeah, it's, nice. it, yeah. And just, just to, the way that, um, for me, there's, there, there was this sort of sense, um, in that time period of like the, that it wasn't okay to be the way that I am. Like it was sort of the, uh, that there was, uh, like it was a struggle to show up and not be, uh, and, and not be condemned. Like it's sort of like to be okay where I am. And like the, to, to realize like how benign awareness is, it's like, it's already sort of blessed our existence, you know, as messy as we are, as like with all the wounds that we have, with all the, the, uh, the clumsiness and clunkiness of being a human being. It's like, we get to be here as we are. It's like we can, and like there's a, there's a sort of welcome in awareness. It's like a, when awareness touches, it just like opens and soothes what's here. It's like, we, we, it's like, wow, we get to be here. Yeah, that's nice. Mm. It's very soothing just talking to you. I'm all, I'm, I'm not always as mellow as this during interviews. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kind of like sitting here like a blob. <laughs> um, here's a question that came in from someone named Eli. Um, could you please say something about the falling away of emotions, if you have any experience with that? Mm. 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 Yeah, for me, it's it's like what we call emotions. Um, Again, it's sort of like there's gross emotions, so like there's sort of like there might be anger or like uh, sadness or fear or something, and it's and it like as we open, like the more subtle layers reveal themselves. So it's it's like a, the, there's a mutation that ha uh, 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 that happens, like a, no, it's not a word, word, but uh, it's like we find like the sort of the layers of truth that are, uh, that are deeper than uh, the sort of manifesting um, emotions, you know, that the mind would call and think it thinks it knows. So it's like we are, we get in touch with sort of the, the, uh, the openness of what's here, like the, the sort of the, the holding for everything that's here, everything that we are. So there's, there's not an identification with emotions might be another way to put it. Like, so when, when things show up that are uncomfortable, we, we often like immediately, like, I don't want to feel this, this shouldn't be here. Oh, it's bad that this is here. I'm unevolved. I'm, I'm not, not, a, not what I'm supposed to be. And then as we open to it, when we allow it to be here as it is, when it, it sort of opens by itself, it's like this, this, uh, this shift into, um, You know, like open space where we're still really present, like really sensitive to what's being felt, all the different uh, things that are here. Um, but there's no, but there's there's nothing. It's almost like it's impersonal. Like there's no, uh, like uh, this is good or bad because it's here. Like there's no one to take the credit or take the blame for any of it. It's just like this is what's in the field. This is what's being experienced. This is what's being felt. Mm. Yeah, not judging. Yeah, yeah. It's like, like so intimate with what's here. It's like... Yeah, it's kind of one theme, I think, that underlies everything you're saying. Um, 
is that there's a there's just a deeper dimension to life if you like call it a vertical dimension and although that's just a you know word but um, you know what what appears on the surface is I think you said something like this in the very beginning what you, what appears on the surface of life is just the tiniest fraction of what's really going on yeah and uh, and your whole approach seems to be to settle more and more and more and more deeply into the, the heart of things. Mm. Yeah, beautiful way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, to really give ourselves to, uh, to, to life, like just to sort of let, let the universe have us. <laughs> oh. That's great. Um, all right. Well, I think. I think, I don't know if any more questions have come in, but I think we've covered quite a bit of ground. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that comes to mind that you want to just throw out there before we wrap it up? Mm. Yeah, I think maybe just to speak uh, to shame just a little bit more, like how, like everything we feel is like innocent. It's like so innocent. And we, when we identify, we like from shame, it's like we're often like, oh, this means I'm bad. Like this feeling that's here means I'm bad. But like, how could a feeling that we're experiencing, like that's just coming into the field, how could that make us bad? It's like, we're so innocent. Everything we experience is so innocent. So it's like really that, um, yeah, it's like so impersonal in a way. It's like, this is what the universe has given us to feel. Yeah. By innocent, you, do you sort of mean like everybody's doing the best they can and even if we do something that, you know, like once in a while I'll have, I'll remember something I did 30, 40 years ago and I'll just sort of cringe like, oh mm -hmm. God, what a, what a thing to have done. And, but you know, it's like that's, you act according to your level of consciousness, your, your level of maturity or whatever. And the fact that I cringe now rather than just sort of saying, oh, that was cool. You know, probably means some progress has been made. <laughs> yeah, and like, and yeah, so it's not, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have the experience of remorse. Yeah, yeah. You know, like to, to like deeply feel like, oh, you know, like. Yeah, well, how could I have been you know, such a jerk? Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and just, um, yeah, without, without condemning ourselves, because it's like, cause it's, I mean, we can see again, it's like innocent. It's like, yeah, like you say, how could I have done differently? I didn't know. Yeah. You know, but it doesn't mean we, we don't, uh, yeah, we don't have the experience of remorse. Like we don't sort of feel like heartbroken for uh, like what we've done. But it's, a, but we can see the innocence of that. And it's like actually a return to our heart. It's like that feeling of remorse. Mm. It's like we return to like the beauty of our heart. Our heart so wants to like own everything we've done that's, that uh, betrays it. Yeah. It's like returning to the truth. We have a follow-up question from <clears throat> Scott in Half Moon Bay, who was the fellow that you know was tempted to drink again. Oh, great! Um, he says, uh, "Thank you." Um, inquiring into the desire to drink brings me to lots of emotion moving in my heart. It feels good to be open there, and it's intense. Maybe I can allow this and love myself. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Well, Half Moon Bay is not terribly far from where you are. Maybe you and Scott can get together and have a session yeah. or two. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, well, thanks, Adam. This has been, for me, a very relaxing and peaceful kind of interview. That you, you know, you just have an air about you that's mellow and, and soothing, and I, mm. I, I really appreciate it. Not that I don't like the more intense <laughs> conversations I sometimes have, but this has been really enjoyable for me and hopefully for the 131 people or so who are watching the live stream and sending wow. questions. And many people will obviously watch the, uh, watch the archive version over the coming weeks, months, years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'll be linking to your website as always, um, adamchaxfield.com, right? Yeah. And yeah. uh, <clears throat> through that, they can people can get in touch with you, get on your email list, I suppose, uh, you know, see what you're up to in terms of retreats, this and that, and uh, the usual. Um, so I'd like to just sort of thank you again, and um, 
thank those who've been listening or watching. And as you know, this is an ongoing series. So if you'd like to get on my email list, there's a place on thatgap.com to do that. You'll be getting about one email a week every time a new interview is posted. Um, this also exists as an audio podcast. So there's, a, there's a page for subscribing to that. Um, there's the donation button, as I mentioned, kind of necessary and much appreciated. And uh, a bunch of other things. If you just explore the menus, you'll, you'll find some interesting little tidbits. So uh, thanks for listening or watching. Next week, I'll be interviewing someone named Annette Karlstrom over in Sweden. So thanks a lot, Adam. And uh, Yeah, thank you, Rick. Yeah. yeah, really, really lovely sharing with you. Great. Mm. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So talk to you later.